How did you get into uh, the vineyard business? Um, well, can I, well, since these guys don't know anymore, uh, do you want the, yeah. from the beginning? Yeah. Um, kind of a weird story. Um, I've always liked growing plants, even like I remember planting a corn seed like in, uh, it was in preschool at Montessori school and it was just like so cool and green. I was just like, this is awesome. And so I've always been growing plants, um, growing up and, uh, I had a little, like, a children's Bible with a lot of pictures and stuff in it, and uh, every couple chapters, it'd be, like, a picture about what was going on in the Bible, and uh, uh, my favorite pictures in those were the ones of vineyards, because they were beautiful green, very uh, pastoral, and just, like, these, this just beautiful, and just something clicked with me, and so I always kind of knew uh, I wanted to be involved in agriculture and uh, growing things, and it seemed like a perfect fit, uh, uh, because the wine, the viticulture industry, you know, marries, you know, science with tradition and thousands of years of history. Um, and it's a burgeoning industry, and it was just seemed like a great fit. And then you said that you came to school here in Oregon? So um, I didn't really know where I wanted to go to school, and my dad, like, offhand, and I have no idea how my dad would have, would have known this. He's like, yeah, that Corvallis down there at Oregon State, they have a good horticulture program. Um, my dad's a welder. He had, like, I have no idea. You know, like, spent, like, six months in college to avoid Vietnam, and I was like, how do you know, Dad? But uh, I looked it up, and he was completely right. Um, it has one of the premier horticulture industries, um, or horticulture programs. They didn't really have a, anything in viticulture, um, but I figured they'd probably have a class or two, and, you know, at least I'd be down here and uh, closer to the action. I didn't want to go to, down to California because... Um, I don't like California, so or I didn't at the time, uh, and uh, so I, I went down there, and uh, there was a few different classes they offered, and by the time I'd left, they'd, uh, uh, they'd gotten enough funding to do a, um, a viticulture and enology option within horticulture, and uh, luckily I was able to take the right classes, and I was the first graduate in uh, viticulture and enology. Um, while I was there, because, you know, you can only learn so much from school, uh, they had actually, uh, Oregon State has a, uh, a research vineyard, and uh, they had lost, uh, the, the manager they had for that had left to do his own, a commercial uh, wine uh, project. And you, who was that? Uh, my immediate predecessor was Jeff Sigan, who uh, created Sahaley Wine Bar in Corvallis. His predecessor was Matt Compton, who started uh, Spindrift Cellars um, out of Philomath. Huh. And um, uh, so they'd actually lost funding, so they couldn't replace Jeff's position. And so they hired, they were looking for a student uh, to kind of do the job. And so um, I uh, learned my viticulture, or my grape growing from Scott Robbins, who is kind of the horticulture farm manager. Uh -huh. And that was a, a very cool uh, experience for me because uh, uh, Scott was an excellent teacher and knew a lot about the history of, and uh, the kind of the philosophy of, of growing grapes and making wine. And um, so I was uh, worked there in '05 in the beginning of '06 uh -huh. and um, able to you know kind of see my efforts uh, uh, bear fruit. And uh, my friend Scott, I still keep in contact with him a lot and uh, learn how to make wine and in an old prune drying shed and it was just really quintessentially Oregonian because it was just like you know just hanging out on a Saturday like no commercial like thoughts at all it was just making the best wine you can with your friends and it was just as, as Scott would say killer it was just huh. awesome huh. so tell me we were talking about like the vineyard tell me a little bit about what makes a great vineyard um the the numbers that they they tell you is you know you're looking for 400 to 700 feet elevation and south by southeast uh, slope and uh, yada yada for soils. But what I really like is uh, there's kind of like this magic component, and um, you're there's just something about a site that can really kind of speak to you. Uh, some of my favorites are um, these sites that are kind of that are alone. They're just surrounded by forest or or kind of wild land, scrub oak, and uh, dug for forest and uh, rivers, and I've found uh, turtles in vine walking through vineyards 
uh, big gopher snakes. I've seen uh, last year I kicked uh, a goat out of my vineyard that was eating, munching on some stuff. The year before that, I kicked some, uh, uh, I had to chase cattle. I was like, thinking about, okay, I went to college for four years and I'm trying to, I'm whipping my hat around trying to get these cattle out of the vineyard. Um, you see deer all the time. You see elk, um, lynx, different uh, hawks and eagles and things. And um, uh, there's kind of like, uh, these moments of what we call vineyard zen where uh, uh, you just kind of feel at one with the universe and uh, I can remember several times the first time it ever happened to me I was down at Woodhall and we were harvesting and it was like it was dark it had been the, there was a, just hours after uh, um, after the sun had gone down and I was we we're almost done and uh, I get on the tractor to go dump some uh, some stems from the destemmer crusher, and I'm driving along uh, through these uh, with the tractor lights on, and I can only see what's directly ahead of me. And I was like, "Well, I wonder if I could see if I turn the lights off." I turned the lights off, and it was this completely magical moment where, like, the moon just illuminated the entire like field. I kind of broke out through the vineyard rows into this open field on the bottomlands and could see everything by moonlight it was just it was completely just vineyard zen and it was just like it was so cool i got back up to the top and uh i told scott i was like man you wouldn't believe how cool this was you know i just you know talking to god like right there and he's like well we got you there's no turning back after something like that and you know he was right Uh there's just uh uh so many opportunities to just kind of be close to to nature and uh and the divine and stuff like that. It was just really cool. Yeah. Tell me, you were talking about FM. Tell me about like the FM story. Um, that was actually my friend Scott, uh, Scott Robbins, uh, who uh, he was touring a, a winery, and there was uh, different winemakers will mark uh, the barrels um, with a different strategy, and one was labeled FM. And my buddy Scott was like, well, what's FM? Is that like a grape variety, like frugal muscat or something like that? Or... And he's like, the winemaker's like, oh no, uh, we were tasting that barrel and there was just some indescribable good quality in it. And we, everybody looked at each other and they're like, man, that's fucking magic. <laughs> and so uh, they wrote that on the barrel. And uh, I described a lot of things in the industry where, um, you know, in a, a vineyard site, you, you know, you play it by the numbers and there can be a vineyard with no soul. There's no magic there. Um, Pinot. Um, uh, you get it, it goes into barrel rough and carbonic and then it takes months and sometimes years to kind of wrestle with itself and then there's this moment where bam like the pinot becomes pinot noir and it's just fm it's just magic huh. um when you're out in the vineyard tell me a little bit about what you hear what you see, what you smell. You've talked a little bit about what you feel. Um, one thing I... Uh, uh, my my job's a little uh, uh, different than uh, what I'd like it to be. Uh, there's, I hear my cell phone far too often. I like, uh, like kind of just being out in the field. Um, it's a lot cooler than you normally think. Like on a, on a hot day, you can... Uh, still have cool breezes you're kind of among the vines um i do a lot of uh, feeling of the leaves to see if they're water stressed and even on a hot day if the vines aren't stressed um they're the the surface of the leaf is cool and that's how you know if it's time to irrigate or not and um so if it's if it's not cool then it's time to irrigate yeah so if the leaf is hot that means that it's closed its stomates and it's no longer transpiring water it's no longer basically sweating because it doesn't have enough uh, water to uh, to exchange, and then it's also stopped uh, creation of new carbohydrates. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of science involved um, in the whole industry. But you know, it comes down to feeling a leaf, and uh, oh boy, that's warmer or too cool. Um, they also can do infrared satellite passes for that, but it's not as fun. Um, the probably the two couple just. Uh, really fun things to do in the vineyard. Uh, about this time, you know, April, um, is mowing down like a big, thick cover crop, like an annual cover crop you planted. 
it just it'll grow um, two three feet tall, and it'll, um, we put in a, a crimson clover in there. So you've got this really cool stand of just really thick, lush, like a big salad. You just want to take a bite out of it, and you come through with your with your mower, and it's just like this really wonderful smell of um, uh, fresh cut grass, and very obvious, you know, that you've achieved something. You can look back and say, you know, this is a cut vineyard and uh, a cover crop, and it's just a lot of uh, a lot of fun, a lot of sense of you know I've done something. Um, the one of the predominant soil orders uh, you've undoubtedly heard of is Jory. It's that blood red soil of the Dundee Hills and the uh, uh, Cascade Range foothills and everything. Um, Jory is about the is probably the easiest uh, soil to farm, and um, because it's very very deep, not a lot. There's no rocks in it. Um, easy to press posts. Um, it dries out very fast after a rain. It can rain, and uh, the next day be dry enough to get a tractor on it. It's just wonderfully structured, and just it's beautiful. Like just you grab it in your hand, and it's just it has this wonderful texture, and the color is just amazing. It looks like like this blood red, and it's just like you go tilling and things, and that is with there's some moisture in it, and it's just a beautiful color. Um, you feel like you're uh, kind of seeing things in like high definition it's just like this beautiful green cover crop like these dark brown trunks and then bursting new green shoots and then this blood red soil and it's just very stark and very amazing yeah um we talked about this a little bit earlier uh one of the things that that i hear a lot is that the wine is made in the vineyard and uh you know, I want to get your take on that as being the guy that does the vineyard. Um, if uh, people are listening to this 100 years from now, I was actually late to this interview, and so I was wrong, but Giannis also didn't record the first talk we had. So, we're, we're <laughs> karmic- so that's what we're referring to. And so we're karmically equal, um, hopefully. Um, wine truly is made in the vineyard, um, especially Pinot Noir. This is what we grow in uh the Willamette Valley of Oregon is Pinot Noir. It's um, the the poet's grape. It's not uh, it's not it's a fraction of the world market, but everybody contends it's it's the best one. And if you if you can, you'll try um, the Heartbreak grape. And one of the reasons for that is it's most expressive of terroir. Um, and so. Uh, a Pinot Noir is more made in the vineyard than any other grape variety for that reason, because it expresses that sense of place. Um, so much of the uh, uh, the total wine experience is derived from the the site, the clone, the client, or the uh, the variety, and the the vintage, what year it was, and very little is done by the winemaker. Um, a winemaker's job is to get out of the way and let everything else happen um, and toss a mess or two in there while you're at it. So a uh, winemaker's job is to not screw up what God and the vineyard manager have given him. And uh, the uh, uh, vineyard manager's job is kind of to bend nature to his will to an extent. Um, a natural setting has weeds growing everywhere, stealing water from your vines. Um, it has uh, mildew. Um, it has all different animals that will bees, deer, um, gophers, moles, voles, squirrels, like all these different things that will eat your grapes. If, I've seen wild turkeys eat grapes. Um, um, all these things. And the, the viticulturalist has to kind of balance all these things and... Uh, needs to produce top quality uh, fruit at the end. But I think um, a viticulturalist, he's trying to provide a format for the the soil or the site, I'll put it that way, the site, the year, and the variety to really express themselves. So uh, as much as I beg on winemakers, just stay out of the way. You know, a viticulturalist has to do that to an extent as well. He needs to provide, you know, a good canopy management and good management so that uh, the grape can express their that terroir, um, that sense of place. And um, 
it's the majority of of the wine um you can just you can taste um with time you can taste a specific vineyard and you can you can tell that vineyard apart from other ones in the same area um per, which is particularly true of pinot noir um and that's that's the funness of it is you know the Willamette Valley is now uh has six sub appellations um and they're all radically different radically different soils and which is the uh predominant factor in that which affects um most other things in the vineyard and it's just uh very fun to see those inter interchanges of um these different uh, viticultural areas with pinot noir so can you taste your work in the in the wine um No, because winemakers never give me any wine, uh, <laughs> so I don't really know. I just have to kind of toss it up there and, and uh, do my best. Um, but I think, in a good in a good way, I shouldn't taste my work. Um, if I get the, uh, you can taste herbaceousness, which means uh, that you harvested too soon. Um, or it's alcoholic, which means um, it need, may have needed more uh, irrigation in the field um, or other factors. And I would prefer to take a back seat with the winemaker and uh, say, okay, this is, if 2006 was amazing, I want to say, wow, this is a really expressive Ribbon Ridge AVA um, uh, hot year. This is a beautiful Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, I'd rather not put my... my thumbprint my fig my signature on it um and you can see that in in different winemaking styles and things like that where it's uh you know it's very okay this this tastes like that winemaker i'd rather be expressive of the, that terroir and that sense of place and so you're saying that you can taste like that the uh, you know like the especially that vineyard that you like that that's kind of isolated the lewis and clark uh vineyard you can taste that environment you can taste uh, like that goat that walked through there, <laughs> and um, uh, you can taste the deer and the, the ho overhead hawk. Uh, to an extent, um, as a scientist, I know there are uh, definitely interplays uh, between the soil texture and the water s status of the vine, uh, which indicates how much sugars it can accumulate and at what time of the year and things like that. So I know scientifically there is there is a case for terroir. Uh, there's a case for that sense of place, and then I'm. There's also, you know, if we weren't, if everyone in the industry wasn't a little bit of a poet uh, and a romantic, they wouldn't be in it because uh, we're not doing it for the money. Um, and so there is that magic sense that uh, uh, that that love and that uh, that magical area is uh, part of that's in the wine that goes out all over the world and hopefully sharing a little bit of that uh, that magic. Yeah. Have you um, tasted, uh, like, French Pinot? Um, not good ones. Uh, just cheap ones, honestly. <laughs> um, I've heard, I know uh, most of what I know about French wine just from uh, academic study. I don't have much experience. Yeah, I was wondering if you had tasted a, a difference. Um, I can definitely, I can actually, uh, we work with a winemaker, a couple different winemakers, and you can smell a French style. Um, you can smell a wine and tell if it was a French person who made it because, um, they have a very, um, complex, um, style of making wine. And I actually had, I've had pretty good luck of smelling, okay, this is, uh, this is a French, a French winemaker because they have got that. It's very, uh kind of like almost a little bit microbial which is like to a new world winemaker it can be a fault but the french don't care and they're like ah, it has complexity and it's the, they're the very layered wines um and uh, uh they're uh they're very good but there's uh new world wines are much cleaner and crisper and more less complex more simple um in a, huh and uh, so you can definitely, and that's, I don't know, um, these French winemakers are growing up with that, uh, uh, that complexity and that kind of style. And even when they're here, that's what they like to do. Hmm. That's interesting. I was just thinking, you know, too, like uh, Varnique, uh, Druin, and then Laurent um, at uh, Salina. 
Yeah. Uh, and he's been over here for so long time. I don't know if you consider him French or not. Well, I uh, I think yeah, Laurent is a uh, pretty French, um, but his wine kind of has that. And then uh, Isabelle Dutart is a winemaker we work with a lot, and um, she actually she learned her stuff from Veronique. And um, there's so I, she's from um, the right next to it. Um, yeah, Duponte. Yeah. And we manage her vineyard. Uh-huh. Um, and um, uh, I think those those three you can kind of smell like this complexity and uh, and it's it's wonderful, but it's different. Uh huh. Huh. That's that's very very interesting. Yeah. Huh. Um. When you're planting a vineyard, what kind of a thought process do you have? You know, what 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 goes into the the, the thinking, you know, before you put the first plant in there. Um, why the reason we recommend hiring a, a vineyard uh, manager day one is because the decisions you make on your first day of being in the vineyard business are ninety percent um, of the important decisions you'll make. Everything you do after that is is secondary, and so you want to uh, be thinking about row orientation. Um, which part of the vineyard to plant, elevation. When you say row orientation, that's for? Um, ideal is north-south um, because that uh, gets light on both sides of the, uh, of the grapevine. Um, if, but that also uh, figures into operator safety because sometimes you've got so much side hill you can, you'll roll your tractor, um, which you don't want to do. Um, and uh, so perfect is north-south, and then you kind of have to make negotiations depending on the topography and safety. Okay, should we plant this? Is it worth it to plant this? Um, this for say a really ugly, uh, super rocky spot. Um, there's uh, one vineyard we manage that's just pure rocks. And uh, where's that? It was actually the one uh, you came up to. It was Black Hole. Oh yeah, Black and, Hole. But I, we never went to the actual like the really rocky spot of it. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh huh. And. Every other, most other wine grape growing regions of the world, they're looking for rocks. They love rocks yeah. um, because then it allows you to control vigor. Um, and that's one of the challenges in Oregon is we can't control vigor uh, in the early side of the season because the soils are so full of water. Um, uh, and so these rocky areas really allow you to kind of have more of a control in, uh, in what grows. And then, you know, you end up with these beautiful... Uh, Pinot Noir clusters in a in a small year can be like a big uh, Doug fir cone. It's just tiny, and all that concentration and flavor is just a powerhouse. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, so north south is is uh, ideal. Um, then there's a variety. Should I grow uh, Zinfandel or Pinot Noir? Now it's an easy question uh, because you know the price you're getting per ton for Pinot is significantly higher than anything else. The first generation guys had no idea. I've seen uh, Cabernet Sauvignon that was a you know first generation planting that it ripens but not uh, commercially. Um, well, it's there. I'll put it that way. And uh, uh, and so variety is a huge question. Uh, clone of those varieties is a huge question. Um, it seems uh, odd that you would worry so much about you know one specific clone of you know because every Pinot Noir vine theoretically is all from from one vine way back in the way back in the day in the Roman times. But uh, you know the one one four. Uh, I've got some winemakers who you know they won't even touch it. They wouldn't take it if it was free. Um, and then other ones who love it to death. Um, Pomard. You know, one of the first clones planted here, still the workhorse, and um, it's very heavily planted. Um, all the other myriad clones, the new ones coming up from California in uh, this kind of third wave, um, the heritage clones, so to speak, um, all these things kind of uh, uh, come together, and you, uh, what we uh, suggest is clonal blending. Um, there's no wine from a single clone that will taste as complex as a, a blended wine um, from different clones. Um, rootstock is fantastically important. Um, do you want a, a relatively high vigor uh, uh, clone, or pardon me, rootstock, that will enable the uh, vine to handle stress better, to 
prolong ripening and then you get more hang time? Do you want uh, a devigorating rootstock to keep your vigor in control? But the, the vigor of the plant itself. Correct. The vigor of the plant itself, but at the cost of harvesting two weeks earlier. Um, what's the climate going to do? Uh, do you want to go on 3309 to, uh, uh, to push it later, or do you want to go on riparia um, and get it younger, um, get it faster? Um, do you have irrigation um, testing the soils? Um, do these soils need drain tile? Um, those, uh, do they need uh, amendments? Um, do they have nematodes? Does it have phylloxera? Um, all these other considerations. Um, also, uh, block layout. It's uh, a lot of times people, you know, talk to their winemaker friends and uh, then they go plant a vineyard and they've got a hundred clones in. Uh, not a hundred clones, but they've got dozens of clones in a one acre vineyard. Well, that's going to be a nightmare to manage going forward. Um, all these things have to be, and winemakers, every winemaker says, oh, high density, high density. Well, a winemaker doesn't exist in the real world. A winemaker doesn't have to go out there and get it done. A winemaker's not paying you to farm it. When you've got twice as many plants, it's going to cost you twice as much to prune, twice as much to do um, all crop thinning, harvest, and all these other things. Winemaker doesn't care. He's not looking out for you. They're just, you know, sipping, uh, <laughs> sipping wine at Tina's, so they don't, you know, it has no bearing on their mind. Like, they're not thinking in numbers. They're thinking in poetry and uh, <laughs> bullshit. Um, but uh, uh, to a farmer, uh, those are very significant concerns. Um, you know, farmability, profitability, um, and... Uh, you know, you have to take all these things into consideration when you're planting a vineyard. Um, if we're going to do it right, these things will be around for 60 to 80 years. And uh, you don't want to be cutting any corners on day one. Uh, a lot of vineyards have crooked rows. It's like you couldn't spend the extra, uh, and uh, you couldn't spend the extra, like, 20 minutes, like, to get it, or it's probably more like two days, two days on, in, on day one to get them, like, straight. And uh, as opposed to just, oh, well, don't worry about it, and uh, cutting corners. Uh, well, I won't tile. I'll just do it. You know, I won't tile. I don't have the 1400 bucks an acre. This is going to be around when your grandkids are in college, and you don't want to, like, put in the extra investment to make this a top-quality site. Um, uh, air drainage is something to look at for frost damage and all sorts of things. Um you plant mostly Pinot. Correct. Um, what, what's not Pinot, we have a little bit of Chardonnay, uh, a little bit of Riesling. Um, I don't think any other reds. Uh, yeah, we got a little Syrah test block thing going on. Huh, where's that? Um, it's up at Dallavina. Um, that's uh, close to Black Hole. Um, and 2008 will be its first crop. Oh, huh. Um... What's the difference in vineyard personalities? You know, does the Pinot have a different kind of vineyard, have a different personality than, uh, you know, some of these other uh, varietals? Um, kind of the personality question goes into, like, like the heart of, like, what is Oregon wine? And um, I learned my grape growing down in kind of the South Valley, Corvallis, uh, Scott Robbins, and... Um, just these small vineyards, you know, in California, you got 100,000 acre vineyards, not a problem. Um, run through it, poof, annihilate it. And in Oregon, you know, our average is still, you know, 20 to 40 acres. These are still small, family organized things. Um, you never hear that guy, oh, yeah, he made a whole bunch of money in the wine industry, and now he, you know, now he's going to go play professional basketball. Play, it goes the other direction. Um, and so this is a labor of love and, uh, and you see it out there. Um, there's these small, cross your, cross your driveway. Um, there's these very small, um, uh, small plots, you know, kind of like the best, uh, best south facing slope. And they just planted that, um, you know, there's grass growing in the aisleways. Um, it's very, it's very, uh, it's very pastoral. It's very kind of homey, um, it you can kind of see to a, on a lot of these vineyards. It's not um, it's not about a business. It's not about uh, the numbers. It's about the in, it's about the uh, 
the magic, the love, the uh, the being in the industry that that people like. Um, a lot of people uh, do this on their spare time. People on, I've got quite a few clients who have a full time job and then on Saturdays they're out spraying or they're out mowing or uh, they're out in the field um, just walking walking uh, down the uh, down the rows just kind of breathing in and experiencing it. Well, you were saying, uh, we were talking about vineyard personalities, and then, then you were saying, um, like, the what what makes an Oregon vineyard. And so this is, you are talking about, like, the small size and the, the intimate kind of relationship between, like, an owner or, you know, the people and the vineyard. That, that's yeah, your... yeah, that's uh, kind of the sense um, I'm trying to get across. And also the, the integration between... Um, uh, kind of the winemaking and the grape growing. Um, in Oregon, you're more likely to see um, the the winemaker and the grape grower being the same guy. Um, and this is kind of going away as uh, the whole thing becomes a bit more corporate and um, there's more management companies like, for example, uh, the company I work for. Um, but kind of the Oregon ideal is, you know, oh, well, I'm out managing my vineyard and then um, then I'm also making the wine um, up in my up in my garage kind of thing um and uh that's some of the some of the best wine is these small lots uh quality um quality production and uh just kind of the oregon mystique is just this small vineyard uh small winery small production most you know we have hundreds of wineries and we have a handful that are up in the you know 50 to 100,000 case a year range almost all of it's done by these small um you know fraction of the thousand case productions up to you know five ten thousand case productions that's very small it's still very craft um you know people asking their friends hey can you come over it's we got a de-stem and crush and we got a punch down um i make my wine in a uh, uh my in-laws basement uh kind of thing and um that's just kind of typical of oregon it's like in france there's the I think it's the Garagistas or something. You probably know more about them than I do. But um, it's kind of this, this bootstrap pioneer um, sense. And that's, to me, that's what Oregon wine is. It's um, shooting for the utmost in quality um, and doing it our way. Um, being these pioneers and uh, doing it the best we can ourselves. Uh-huh. So what has the vineyard, you know, taught you personally about, like, life? Um, kind of thinking ahead, uh, just in my own life, uh, when you're, there's days where, um, actually, yesterday, Saturday, it was like 8 o'clock, and, you know, we're, we're digging holes to put in, I got a little side project, and uh, putting in some end posts, and, uh, you know, the temptation is, eight o'clock on a Saturday. It's like, I want to go home, man. So it's like, screw it. Let's just good enough. Muscle man, let's, you know, more or less. And, uh, you got to fight that and you got to say, this is a, you know, this is a permanent thing. Um, I'm going to do it right and, uh, do it once and then, uh, think years ahead and then plan. Um, when it's a sunny day in, in January, um, you can get out there and you can spray your herbicide. But if you're not thinking about that, you're going to have weed problems all through the rest of the year. Um, do what you can when you can, and then uh, your crises become significantly deamplified because you've taken care of what was possible as soon as you could. Um, thinking ahead, being a lot more tranquil. Um, uh, what do you mean? Uh, thinking ahead and being a lot more tranquil. Um, just trying to... Uh, like thinking ahead in terms of like, okay, what's coming up six months, um, a month from now, six months from now, uh, 10 years from now. Um, and then kind of being tranquil because, you know, don't let, uh, don't get scared by the amount of work you've got out there and, um, don't get harried, um, and always be in the right mind. Uh, there's, you know, machinery we work with that can be dangerous and, uh, people have died in tractor accidents and, and things like that and um, nothing we do is worth um, uh, endangering your life for and uh, uh, it's you've got to keep all of your uh, priorities in line you know uh, safety 
uh, top quality fruit and sustainability. You know, it's not worth cutting corners uh, to endanger any of those things. Sustainability, that's a big word, um, especially here in Oregon. Um, tell me a little bit about what sustainability is to you. Um, it is a bit of a, a buzzword, and that's why um, I like uh, kind of putting uh, some organizations to it. Um, in my mind, we farm all of our stuff uh, according to the live guidelines, which is low impact viticulture and analogy. And um, what it means, there's dozens and dozens of chemicals out there I wouldn't use on, uh, I wouldn't use in a spacesuit. They're they're bad for the environment, bad for everything, and we don't use those. Um, Live was created as an organization to uh, uh, help you look at um, the way you farm and improve that, um, and uh, they allow you to use two different herbicides. Uh, glyphosate and um, uh, glufosinate, which is called rely, and these are very uh, uh, low impact chemicals. It actually, you can actually uh, eat more glyphosate uh, than you can aspirin. Aspirin would kill you first if you're eating uh, the uh, same amount of uh, aspirin and glyphosate. Um, so they're using very soft chemicals. Um, they allow you to use synthetic fungicides. Um, the cell walls of fungus are made of a substance called chitin, which doesn't exist in plants, doesn't exist in animals. And these brilliant organic chemists are spending days and years creating these things that only attack chitin um, or this other thing specific to, uh, to fungus. Um, so we're able to use those. We spray less, we use less fossil fuels, um, and it uh, provides better, better quality. Um, the problem I have with organic certification is that it's uh, uh, it's too narrow minded. Um, it doesn't uh, it only tells you what you can't do. It doesn't tell you what you can do. Um, uh, sulfur, which is one of the only things you can spray in organic, in the backbone of an organic uh, spray program, can be hideous. Um, I've heard of uh, people getting nosebleeds out in a vineyard where they're spraying too much sulfur. You're out there working and you get a nosebleed. That's, you know, ugh, it's disgusting. Um, and uh, the live program, they uh, delineate you need to have a 5% ecological uh, setback area. It's just 5% of your property that you don't do anything with. That So it's letting nature kind of have a reservoir for all these other things. Uh, you know, pollinators, animals, some of those uh, uh, things that eat grapes, but it's it's a piece of nature still on your farm. Organic farming um, can be is just as easy to industrialize as anything else, um, and it's a marketing uh, 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 factor to, to some farmers. And in my mind, it's not better for the environment um, to be spraying uh, 40, 50, 60 pounds of uh, sulfur per acre. That's uh, it's atrocious, and it, actually it's not as effective as using fewer, more targeted uh, sprays. Um, I really like the live program, and it is sustainable, and it's it's um, a synthesis of everything we know about farming. It's the best farming practice we can use, and that's also uh, more uh, financially viable for a farmer. Um, creates better wine than same organic wine, um, and it uses kind of all the tools uh, that we can, um, and eliminating some that are just. Uh, not fitting with that philosophy. What about biodynamic? Biodynamic uh, is uh, interesting, and uh, I don't really. The scientist in me obviously says that's a bunch of hogwash. Um, but I've actually had a couple biodynamic wines that were absolutely killer, and they had that magic quality that was like, "Oh, this is great." Um, do I really think fermenting something in a uh, you know, goat horn in the middle of, and then burying it in your vineyard is really going to help. No. Um, but, uh, one of the reasons I think I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, organic food and they're like, well, it just tastes better. And, um, there's no way, there's no scientific reason that something that would taste better just because it's, uh, produced, you know, uh, the egg doesn't know if it would had a synthetic thing fed to it or not. But that care, um, a lot of these organic and biodynamic things are on these small farms. A lot of care and a lot of uh, uh, 
things put into them that does make a difference. And, uh, and that level of care and love can't really, you know, it's, it's going to have an effect on the wine. Mm -hmm. Um, so the biodynamic, um, I've had some great biodynamic wines, I'll put it that way. Yeah. But, uh, if I'm going to be, I'm not going to be the one dancing naked in the, uh, in the moonlight for the, uh, for the festival or whatever. Huh, I haven't heard about that festival. I don't know either, but, uh, <laughs> that's always, that's kind of the presumption that biodynamic eventually we dance naked out in the, the moon cycle. Well, the moon cycle stuff is actually in biodynamic. And yeah. I got an email last harvest where, uh, there was one, one day out of like 10 that it was going to be, uh, sunny to, to harvest. And, uh, the winemaker emailed me, he's like, well, it looks like the, the biodynamic, uh, uh, ideal day is going to coincide with the sunny day. So we're great. Let's do it on the sunny day. And I was like, you bet your ass. <laughs> Cause it's like, if the, bio, cause if the biodynamic day had been on a rainy day, you'd still harvest on the sunny day. Uh -huh. Um, so a lot of these things are, you know, great as long as it doesn't, you know, directly contradict something I know, like I don't want to be harvesting in the rain. Yeah. Um, because you can taste it in wine. Yeah. Can you think of anything else that, that we need to tell people about like Oregon vineyards? Um, I would tell them to, to try the wine and, um, but so much of it doesn't make it out into the, uh, into the general populace so much of the best stuff uh you only get from uh, going to these tasting rooms like kind of being here um to get into these best things and that's like uh the best like a lot of these uh vineyards are doing like you know their 10 best barrels go into a special production kind of thing just for selling in the tasting room and that's the best uh the best experience is to be here in the vineyard in the winery and and being a part of it um that's the terroir that's the sense of place and you can't really get that uh if you're not here if you're not trying the wine um you can get a sense of it um but the best is to is to be here and experience it and then if you have an oregon wine uh when you're a foot uh, when you're a field then you can sip it and remember the sun the rain the uh, uh the laid-back oregon attitude um but they're linked there it's oregon wine it's not wine from oregon it's oregon wine mm -hmm. it's this uh pioneer self-reliant laid-back attitude um and that's our pinot well it's like when you say laid back and stuff like that it's like a couple of especially a couple of the winemakers just kind of hair on the back of their neck stands up people say that and I remember Lynn Penner Ash said we're not laid back you know? well, well she's not laid back but uh because <laughs> I like you know I know so many winemakers who like they look like a Grateful Dead concert when you go into the winery it's just like hey man everything everything groovy you don't you know hey man don't come in here talking too fast or you know you know harsh my buzz it's just like the 70s never ended in some parts of Oregon, and it's like those guys became winemakers if they wanted to make a, a, a day of it. Um, well, you know, that's interesting because um, the 70s uh, was the seedbed or the, the, the ground for, for it. But, um, you know, it's like you talk to these guys, you know, Sokol Blosser and Ponzi, and, and uh, they, they kind of, Adelsheim, David Adelsheim, he was, you know, a hippie, uh, kind of came out of that. But boy, they sure—they're uh, um, not there now. I don't think. Yeah, there's definitely a, kind of a, a generational thing as well, too. Like, kind of like the the Lynn Penarash and Laurent Monlieu, and there's a generation that like uh, uh, that this is a business, and darn it, this is going to be a profitable profitable business. And um, there's nothing wrong with that, and that's the way that the industry is going to go. Um, in my mind, when I think of Oregon Pinot Noir, it's it's the laid back hippie making wine. Well, um, like who who do you think of? Like I'm I'm trying to think. It's like I've probably interviewed I don't know you know thirty maybe forty winemakers in Oregon. The the Grateful Dead concert that's at Laurel Ridge. Those guys are like, hey man, don't bug me, man. Uh, uh, Scott Robbins guy. I work for. I wouldn't. I don't like to use the word hippie if it's derogatory, but it's just very laid back and um, 
people can get excited about wine, but uh, who would normally get excited about anything else. And um, the the North Valley is also kind of a, a more intense, uh, you know, the Yamhill County, this area, is a very more more intense business-oriented thing. And uh, where I can learn it in the South Valley is just more, you know, it's more laid back. It's, uh, You're thinking King State and... <laughs> Not them, no. Uh, they might be laid back. Um, just most of the winemakers I know are, you know, they listen to kind of contemporary jazz or kind of some the the golden oldies, and um, they take their wine seriously, but they don't, yeah. but they don't take life excessively seriously. They're they're just uh, they keep everything in perspective. Huh, that's interesting. This book will be a very interesting book, and it, you know I think you'll actually very much enjoy you know reading what what these people have said. It's like it's tremendous perspective on uh, you know on these issues that you're you're talking about right here right now. Winemakers also lie, uh, so you should keep that in mind. So, <laughs> um, and everybody does because everybody thinks they're a lot. But I've got than pictures they're... of them. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, and uh, uh, everybody kind of has a, a poor sense of kind of they've got what they think of of everybody else and then everybody else can be completely different and in my mind i've got this image of a winemaker who's a uh lazy hipster who wakes wakes up hung over at 11 o'clock and decides wow. where to go for lunch and then uh anytime i ever talk to a winemaker it's like oh where should we do lunch and this is the, that's the, actually the truth it's like anytime you talk to a winemaker like um and that's definitely the truth. Uh, like, they'll drive up to a vineyard, and we've been out in the vineyard. Like, there's fantastically crucial decisions that happen during pruning time in January. I've never, ever seen a winemaker in the vineyard in the rain. I've never seen one in January, February, March. Because they, the they knew a photographer was coming. No, it's uh, like they had to be. January, February, March, April. And then, like, we'll get a winemaker, like, roll in, like, August. Oh, you know. Boy, it's hot out. And then the question is like, boy, can we talk under the tree? So it's like they, they park next to the vineyard, talk under the tree about the vineyard. And then the question is like, where should we go for lunch? Is it Tina's or do you want to go to uh, somewhere else? Wow. And or, or the bistro. Wow. Tina's or the bistro is like your two options. Wow. And so then it's like, oh, wow, four o'clock. Boy. Well, then they'll like complain about how hard their job is. Like, oh, man. After five o'clock, it's like, well, you got there at eleven, so and then you went for lunch for two hours. How hard can this possibly be? It's like, oh, being hungover. It's like, come on, guys. And then it's like, I've got guys out in the field that got there at five a.m. with a hoe, and then they're just happy to be able to uh, to do that. And the winemaker's like, oh man, I only got a ninety-two. Oh, from the spectator, God, it's rigged. I tell you, it's rigged. Um, tell me about climate change. Um. We'll wait and see, actually. Um, in my mind, uh, Oregon, we don't know uh, how fast climate's going to change or um, how much. Or we have uh, a general idea that the average is going to get warmer. We don't know it how... It already is. I mean, Nadri over here has done a lot of statistics. In the last 30 years, it's been average or above, never below average. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so as we're looking at these things, um, it's a big factor of, okay, w what does that mean? Um, and so the Willamette Valley is a good place to be in my mind. Um, they grow Pinot Noir in the Carneros region of uh, California, which is untold hundreds of miles south of here. Um, I grew up there. How far south is it from here? Uh, it um, depends on how fast you drive. Between 10 and 12 hours. <laughs> 10 and 12 hours, that's got to be hundreds of miles. Yeah. Um, and in my mind, when, you know, they're going uh, Pinot Noir way far south. When Oregon, uh, when in the Willamette Valley, we're the farthest south and they're growing it in the panhandle of Alaska, then I'll start to get worried. They are growing it in the... No, when Alaska. they are. When global warming gets to the point where the, the Willamette Valley is the farthest south that it can be grown, um, I'm going to start getting worried. I'm like, shit, maybe I'll have to graft my stuff over to Syrah. But that's another option as well. Um, uh, people get worried. You don't have to take a... You don't have to tear a vineyard uh, out. You can graft it over. And uh, in two years, you'll be up and running. And in those intervening years, we'll get a crop off the uh, the previous one. Um 
it's definitely a concern. Uh, Oregon does get a lot of uh, winter rains. Uh, a lot of uh, Oregon viticulturalists don't irrigate. Winemakers don't want them to irrigate. I uh, believe we, sh- uh, uh, we should use it responsibly for higher uh, wine quality. But if uh, global warming uh, uh, makes our life harder, we still, we're still at kind of the ragged north edge of uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, that entire uh, zone has to ship north before we're on the ragged southern edge of Pinot Noir production. And when that happens, we'll switch to Syrah, wait for another uh, 50 years of global warming, and then by the time we're too hot for Zinfandel and Malbec, then uh, it'll be a thousand years from now and we're ready to switch back. Um, it is, I don't want to uh, say it's not a, a, a very big concern, um, but there are options. We go, uh, you know, 900 feet is, uh, in some extent, kind of a hard deck for being re- able to reliably produce Pinot Noir. Um, with a warmer climate, you can go higher up the hill. Um, you can go farther into cooler cooler sites. You can plant the north side of the vineyard. Um, there's a lot of options that we have and a lot of tools. Uh, we can uh, change our rootstocks. Um, we can irrigate more or less, change our clones, varieties. Um, there's a lot of tools available to the viticulturalist to uh, to deal with things like that. Yeah. Wait till you read what the uh, old timers, you know, like Ponzi's and uh, the Letts uh, and, and those guys say about, you know, like the differences between when they started in the early 70s uh, and and now. And they're, they're definitely saying life is easier now. It is. Um, yeah. Like the hottest year, it was like something like, uh, hottest year on record, I believe, was 98. Um, worldwide and uh, 98 99 up through uh, 06 was hot these were by Oregon standards really hot years some of the best 10 best years of the if you could choose a decade those are the 10 best years of Oregon viticulture um, and 07 what was uh, all the old timers were saying this is you know Oregon normal um, so it was rainy it was cool um, it produced fine wines but the other hot years uh, for us were excellent wines as well mm-hmm. Um there's no, uh, and that's part of the fun is seeing the interchange of uh, of the vintage year on the wine, and um, uh, I think uh, you know if we could have it repeat at ninety eight to oh six, I'd be a you'd, you'd be uh, we'd take you'd a, be happy yeah. everybody everyone like oh I'll take that. Yeah. I was born in eighty four, and that was probably the other bad thing to happen in the Oregon industry, but. 84 when, you were born? <laughs> when I was born, but 84 was just an abysmal year. One of the it was like one of the worst years, and uh, it was just a lot of uh, uh, yeah. the uh, the wines. Uh, the it was kind of before crop thinning became uh, uh, more of a science, and uh, the wines just didn't ripen really watery. And uh, uh, as we learn more, uh, we're able to to deal with cooler years, uh, be able to predict more. As we get more years under our belt, and uh, we can kind of make comparisons. Okay, this year is shaping up to be an 03, um, so what am I going to do different now that I know that? Yeah. Um, things like that. Well, that really, uh, that experience really comes in. Uh, talking to um, uh, Roland Souls, and he, he was saying, it was 07, God, this reminds me of, I can't remember if, if it was 03 or uh, something, and he said, okay, he, he, he said exactly what you said. What did I do then? Oh yeah, we thinned a little bit, and or we didn't thin, or we did this, and um, and uh, and it came out really well. Yeah, O yeah, three was a really hot year, and uh, like O three was I get oh, my years oh, Yeah, O three and like O six were both really hot. I actually have a I could have brought that. I uh, made a handout about a kind of why Pinot Noir in Oregon for one of those passport to Pinot things. But um, very a lot of growing degree days similarities between 03 and 06. Uh-huh. And in 06, um, we had one winemaker um, request because he was buying stuff by the acre. That's another, I'll give you another example why winemakers are awful crap anyway. But um, <laughs> he, in 06, we were able to ripen, I think it was five tons in one specific section of Pinot Noir. In one acre? In, one, in five tons per acre in, uh, in Pinot Noir in, a, in this warm site, uh, warm year. And it was able to do it. You wouldn't have been able to do that in 07. Um, and uh, so that's a big consideration. Okay, how, how much do I want to gamble? Agriculture is inherently gambling. Um, uh, the, the winemakers are full of it. Because um, not so long ago, um, 
almost everybody bought their fruit uh, by the ton. So um, they'd say, okay, I want to uh, get this uh, by the ton, and I don't want you, I want it cropped at 1.4 to 2 ton an acre. You lousy dirtbag farmer, you, if you try to sneak in half a ton, I'm going to be very mad because the concentration is really going to be able to, you know, I want this cropped way down for, for more concentration. So the farmer, um, he always kind of wanted to, to crop a little higher to make more money because it's on a per ton basis. Well, then um, a lot of people got tired of this, this kind of fight. So they said, the winemaker said, okay, tell you what, um, I'll pay you X number of dollars for the acre, and then you crop it as low as I tell you to. I can, you can put it at 0.1 acre, ton per acre. So I can really get that concentration. Well, well, well that as uh, um, concentrated. I've, I've heard of like 0.8 and like and one uh, on the low end, um, wow. which is really is devoted. That? Who was that? Uh, that was uh, Panther Creek, and uh, I don't remember which year it was. Um, wow. In some of their spots, um, but what happened is when it went on to a per acre basis, these uh, winemakers started like, well, you really know what. I think Oregon's warm enough. We could do two and a half tons per acre. Well, you know what? Three ton, you know, really is not that much on a per vine basis. And these people who would scream if you were going over two tons are now saying, well, yeah, let's crop it, you know, three and a quarter tons. You know, I think our vines can handle it and stuff. So it kind of showed a little bit of hypocrisy there where they were going, well, oh, we want to keep it small to get concentration. And then once they realize that they can make more wine if uh, they got if they go three tons. Okay, maybe we'll give it a shot. Uh-huh. But uh, I like every single winemaker I know. I just, the idea of the winemaker is just so. <laughs> you know, it's funny hearing you um, talk about these things, and I've heard so many winemakers, uh, you know, talk about these, these exact same issues um, and why they, they want uh, like the, the the concentration and, and why, and then um, I also think about like the biomass. It's like an acre produces so much biomass, and um, you know that's everything uh, that's in there. And I think about uh, that as being a factor, uh, you know, in there too. Definitely, and uh, there are definitely winemakers who want the physiology of a of a vine better than others. And um, in a high vigor site where there's uh, you actually, in some situations, you want to hang a higher crop because that uh, what you're shooting for is a balanced vine. Um, if you've got a high vigor situation, you really don't want to um, uh, to put on two tons uh, per acre or one ton per acre because it, it can get uh, vegetal. It can it can get over the top, um, and it's not in balance. the The best wines are produced from balanced vines where you know you get kind of a, a good sense of how much canopy and then how much fruit. Um, and those are the best. And so, um, as you kind of get experienced with a vineyard, okay, this is kind of a, you know, what can this vineyard do? And it can be very site specific. Yeah. And and your specific as well. Yeah. Okay, I I think that's all the um, the questions that I have. The. Um, yeah. Fun thing, you know, Oregon wine, um, it's so young, you know, uh, this phase of it, you know, starting in the 60s, um, there's not that many, uh, you know, we're just taking out the first generation stuff, all the stuff that had been in, on its own roots, it's dying or we're taking out or changing our spacings and things like that. And, you know, the people um, that uh, started it are still around, you know, David Lett, Dick Irie, Adelsheim. They're all they're all still here to be able to see the fruits of their labor, and you know, in um, you just kind of you assume it was always this way, um, but really it wasn't. And it took um, uh, these people that we're learning from. Uh, you know, my boss. Uh, you know, we're all pioneers, and um, there's no there's no structure. There's no right answer. Nobody knows. Um, what the best way to grow grapes is. Nobody knows the best way to make wine. Uh, the best vineyards in Oregon may not have been planted yet. Um, there's just so much acreage out there and such a mystery still left to explore in Oregon. I had an interesting conversation with, um, uh, who's the winemaker at Domaine uh, uh, Serene? 
um, shoot, I don't know. Face. Um, anyway, he was going on and on about, you know, like, yeah, we cropped two, two tons per acre max, you know, 1.8, and, you know, how great he was and stuff like that. And, and then I kept thinking about all the guys that, you know, like the Ponzi, Summers, the Letts, and all these guys that when they planted, you know, like they sort of, most of them had looked up and they knew Summer was, was planting and they knew that uh, Kevlar, uh, or uh, uh, what do they call that, uh, Kevlon, Kevlar or something like that. And no one knows what, really what that was, but it might, one of the possibilities might have been a Pinot. It was planted here in the 1800s. Um, you know, so they knew that it was kind of growing, but they, they had no idea that it was really going to work. You know, so those are the real pioneers. Those guys really took a chance. Yeah. You know, and really busted their butts and stuff like that. And here's this, gosh, I wish I could remember the name. You know, it's kind of going on and on about how great he was. And I thought, man, it's like, you wouldn't even be here if it, these guys hadn't have, uh, you know, like done all this stuff. And all these guys, you know. Pump the, uh, the vineyard I uh, started at at Woodhall was, uh, uh, the guy next to him is Dan Jepson. That was um, forgetting the original owner of Woodhall's name. He died a few decades ago, but actually not that long ago. But they were both doctors at the U of O, and uh, they were looking for um, for something more, uh, for a legacy for their for their children and their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I forget the, who said it, but the only reason uh, we see so far today is because uh, we're standing on the on the shoulders of, of giants. And um, these the first generation people, as you're saying, they had you know they did it, and uh, they didn't know they were going to be able to get four ton an acre or four uh, four thousand dollars per ton. They didn't know any of these things. They were doing it um, for the love and for this for this area, and uh, uh, we're just uh, hopefully uh, up to continuing that tradition of uh, science innovation and not forgetting the Oregon roots of uh, that magic. And that's uh, what I am what I like about the industry is to Oregon and Oregon wine. When you say close-knit, what does that mean? And all that kind of stuff. It's, uh, it's amazing. Like, uh, you know, you can know all these people. It's like, oh, yeah, Penrash. Oh, uh -huh. oh, sure. Oh, yeah, Laurent. Uh, and uh, uh, my mother-in-law was at a function in Portland and um, uh, she was making conversation with a, a fellow there, and he's like, well, you know, this is going great, but I think when I retire, I'm going to join my daughter in the wine industry. She's like, no kidding, what's your, what's your uh, daughter do? And she says, oh, well, his, uh, uh, her husband, a uh, fellow named Matt Compton, who owns Spindrift Cellars down in Flomath. Well, I buy my personal wine from Matt Compton. Uh, he's a great friend of mine. Uh, one of my good friends through college works for Matt. Um, and uh, he had my job at Woodhall uh, uh, years before I did. Uh -huh. And it's just like this incredible loop. And it's like everybody knows each other. And um, uh, like, well, Veronique uh, drew on. Uh, she interned with, I believe, the IRA as well as, as Adelsheim. And, um, and also Bethel Heights. And Bethel Heights. He managed the wine industry, which is unique. We don't see each other as confident. Like, we're kind of like fellow... Uh, fellow soldiers, like, you know, all pushing towards the same goal of promoting this Oregon wine and doing the best we can. Every other industry, you'd be mad if a tasting room went next door to you. In the Oregon industry, you're stoked because now you're a bigger draw for these other people. You get to taste, you know, what they can do with their site and their year, um, their, the terroir of their area. And um, it's just, it's a very laid back, and I don't want to overuse the term laid back, but um, uh, it's not, it's very it's anti-competitive almost you want your uh your friends to succeed and make good wine because that makes everybody else better that brings up the uh swapping like hey man can you uh people always say yes have you experienced that personally uh breaking of press no no but you know and sharing of equipment yeah um uh, uh de ponte came up heavy last year and uh they what had do you mean heavy like um they had two, more fruit than anticipated, uh -huh. than they had room for in the winery. And I personally, uh, after harvest, uh, went with a tank in the back of my uh, uh, truck and uh, filled up with the wine at DDO, put it in the tank, drove it back to DuPonte, and pumped it into a 
tank that I swore and drove back and did like three different modes of uh, of moving the sand here. You know, that used to be the norm. There used to not be million dollar facilities. Uh, DDO was the first just, you know, in your garage, something you do because you love it. Uh-huh. And uh, to me, that's when I close my eyes, I think of Oregon wine. It's South Valley, laid back, drinking Pinot in the I asked uh, a lot of the wine owners. It's like, you know, what's, what's the wine industry going to look like in 100 years? Uh, you know, really interesting perspectives, uh, you know, on that. You know, some of these guys that have been around for a really a long time, um, you know, like the pioneer kind of guys, uh, you know, what they thought uh, it was going to be like. And it was some pretty interesting visions. Hmm. Uh, and we'll be in, this is a very interesting project and oh thank you for very interesting thank you for doing it and thank yeah. you for including me and you know the, you the thing is though is like after like i interviewed all these people you know and i kept hearing these you know these these are greats and stuff like that and then i, I sat back and i said yes they've done an incredible thing in a small area they've done a small thing in a very small area you know it's like one percent of you know the total thing and then i thought about you know who are the people that I think are really great? Mother Teresa, you know, people like that. Those are people that are, um, you know, fantastic. But that's not to negate, uh, you know, anything that these guys have done. But I, I had to, when I was done, sort of, I had the bulk of the interviews done. I had to kind of step back and get perspective on, uh, on everything because I just was so inundated with, um, you know, with all this information. Have you been up to a uh, We Manage a Vineyard at? Uh... Vista Hills, they just put up a new tasting room. Really cool. Vista Hills. Um, uh, a fellow named John John and Auntie McClintock on it. It's right next to Domain Serene. Like, it, like the building was up in the last like, oh, four oh, yeah. five months. Um, uh, gosh, Let's got a vineyard right up in that area, and um, I forget who owns that other vineyard. There's yeah. Winters Hill, and then there's White Rose and things like that. Yeah. Um, I, I've driven up there. I've never gone in or anything like that. It's a brand new. It's got a pond out front. Uh, yeah, really, really cool. Um, Wait, what's it called again? Vista Hills. Vista Hills. You should go up there because uh, we, we manage that and uh, uh, try to get a free, free tasting out of them. Uh-huh. But um, uh, John and Nancy McClintock, um, they own that, and um, they had uh, John's one of one of our favorite, uh, not just clients but people, and uh, he's got uh, plenty of money, but you'd never know it, and. Uh, you know what what he tells us he's like you know I just got lucky you know I'm just a normal guy who got lucky a couple couple places along the road and um, still likes to go out and fish and uh, and shoot ground squirrels that are digging up stuff and uh, 10% of all of their proceeds goes to a a foundation he started called the Clint Foundation Uh and um, which provides matching grants to kids working through college and uh, they just believe so much in education, and it's perfect because it, it's like uh, if somebody has a part-time job and makes a thousand bucks, then they match it, and it's another thousand bucks. So it's increasing education, hard work, and yeah. giving back uh, to the community. And uh, it's so important to keep it in perspective because um, wine is just wine, yeah. and uh, it's all—it's uh, not feeding the world. It's not doing anything. No. Um, it's just. Uh, providing fuel to poetry, um, and it's important to keep a perspective on that. Yeah, the the thing that um, that I was trying to do, or that I'm trying to do in this book, though, is like it's about the people, and it's about you know uh, the metal of people, the the thing that people are made of, um, you know, that you aspire to something, you know, or what your thoughts are. But, um, like, there's a lot of really personal stuff in here, and some of them might had to double check to make sure they were okay with me running well wow. um, really personal stuff um, in there um, you know like the struggles with you know second generation winemakers coming in and taking over from the parents you know and some of those parents didn't want to let go uh, and so there's a lot of personal angst and struggle and uh, and things you know so those are I'm really interested in that kind of stuff you know, and that to me is what the wine industry is all about. You know, yeah, I taste a lot of wine and stuff, and have a lot more to learn. But you know, it's about those people, you know, that, that make up the industry. And it, in Oregon, it seems like it's pretty, pretty interesting that, that like this group of people did come together. An interesting 
group of people that came with interesting backgrounds that, that allowed it to kind of happen. And they had, like Adelsheim, pretty sharp cookie in terms of marketing and stuff. Um, you know, and foresight. Okay, here's what we need to do. And these guys, you know, started, you know, Pino Camp. And, you know, what a brilliant idea. It's like, have the guys come here <laughs> instead of us go to the, you know, to the places where they don't know how to pronounce Oregon. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, so it's, it's pretty interesting. Well, I don't have any more questions, so... Sure. Well, thank you very much. Hey, thank you.